In Full Zoom is presented by Calvo Enterprises, Inc. and IT&E. Half a day and welcome to another edition of In Full Zoom. I'm Nestor Lecanto. You may have noticed that we are deviating a little bit from our normal format of Zoom. And we're in the studio here because we have a very special guest. And she is the U.S. Ambassador to Albania, but she grew up here in Guam. Uh, Ambassador Yur Kim, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for inviting me. Before we get into your job as Ambassador of Albania, I wanted to get you to talk a little bit about uh, growing up here in Guam, how your family got here and how you graduated from the academy and that sort of stuff. Yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I'm really proud of uh, is that I am from Guam. Um, I was born in Korea, um, but when I was about three years old, my father moved us uh, here to Guam. And uh, so it was my father, my mother, um, and my younger brother, and we uh, came out here. Um, and then uh, we moved back to Korea and then came back permanently in 1976. Um, just in time for uh, Typhoon Pamela. And <laughs> Perfect timing. Yeah. Exactly, yeah, we took the island by storm. Um, <laughs> Literally. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so uh, we've been here ever since. And so I grew up, I went to uh, uh, LBJ, and then I went to Tamuning Elementary for the second grade. And then from third grade on to eighth grade, I was at the uh, St. Anthony School, and then at the uh, Academy of Our Lady for high school. And then after that, I went off to um, the University of Pennsylvania. Um, but the experience of uh, having grown up on this island in this very um, multicultural, friendly, um, and uh, you know, very uh, warm environment um, has shaped the rest of my life. And um, it's, it's enriched uh, my professional career too in ways that I hadn't expected. Yeah, I want to talk a lot more about your professional career, but I, I do want to ask you about another um, event in your life, a, a tragic event, unfortunately, and that was um, your mother was on that uh, Korean airline flight 801 that crashed here on Guam. Uh, tell us a little bit more about that. Um, yeah, well, everybody knows that uh, this is the 25th anniversary of uh, that tragic event. And um, I think everybody deals with uh, the loss in their own way. I have to say from my perspective, it's meant a lot to us to have had um, such uh, a close circle of friends and family around us throughout the, the 25 years, people who still get together with us and um, uh, help us uh, uh, recall um, our mother. Um, who was, uh, you know, she was such a special personality. And um, one of the ways that we try to honor her and remember her is um, through a series of uh, scholarships at the high school and university level. And so I think so far um, since we started the scholarship um, uh, shortly after her death, um, we have um, uh, benefited probably more than 20 students and have um, distributed um, probably about $150,000 or so, maybe more, I don't know. I've lost track uh, and I'm not involved anymore because of uh, my current position. Sure. My brother has taken over that yeah. young say. And I'm sure so many people on Guam uh, remember your mom, Jane, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But let's talk about your, your career. As you mentioned, you went to the University of Pennsylvania. I yeah. think they have a business school there that's a little bit well known. A right? little bit, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then you went to Cambridge. Um, that's right, yeah. Uh, talk about uh, the, your, the edu your college education. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I thank the Sisters of Mercy for having provided me an excellent education here at the Academy of uh, Guam. And um, so when I went off to the University of Pennsylvania, um, I felt like, uh, you know, I was fully prepared. And um, in fact, I felt I had an advantage because uh, for me, coming from Guam, it felt very natural to be in an environment with people coming from different countries and different language backgrounds and cultures. And, um, and for many people who grew up uh, stateside, I think that was uh, a little bit more of a shock. A for culture them. shock for yeah, them, right? Because they're yeah, used yeah, to being, yeah. Around, yeah being I in a never, homogenous yeah. society. Sure. And uh, for people from Guam, I think it's just so, so natural. Um, and being in a homogenous society is the uh, a, a anomaly for us. Right. So um, it was quite interesting being at, uh, at university, and um, it was a great experience. Yeah. What made you um, uh, get into um, foreign service? I wanted to be in public service. 
and um, I looked around and um, honestly, I ended up joining the State Department's Foreign Service almost by accident. Um, you know, it was uh, the mid 90s um, and it was a time, you remember Nestor, uh, <laughs> when uh, <laughs> the internet was not a big thing. Yeah. And well, um, <laughs> if you were looking for a job, you would actually have to look through physical listings of jobs. And um, so, I, you know, I had finished graduate school at Cambridge and I came uh, back to the States. I went to Washington because um, I thought that that would be the right place to start looking for a job in, in public service. And um, as part of that uh, uh, job search process, I went back up to the University of Pennsylvania to look at the listings that they had in their giant binder. And while I was waiting to talk to the career counselor, my eye just happened to catch uh, the brochure. So I was flipping through the brochure and there's a practice test in the back and the criteria are listed. And I thought this looks like fun. <laughs> so I signed up for the test and, um, you know, I just kept passing each stage. And uh, before you knew it, um, I was in the Foreign Service. And I have to say, I've loved the career ever since. In Full Zoom is presented by Calvo Enterprises, Inc. and IT&E. GU Self Storage, conveniently located near the Harmon McDonald's. We offer affordable rates, online payments, and auto bill pay for your convenience. Plus, gate access daily from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Call us today at 648-7867 for more information. In Full Zoom is presented by Calvo Enterprises, Inc. and IT&E. And the Foreign Service has taken you, you to so many exotic places. Tell us a little bit more about some of the countries that you've served at. So I started out in East Asia because I wanted to be near home. You know, it was uh, uh, so I, I I wanted to go to China for my first assignment, and I got there in um, the summer of 1997, um, and then I stayed on in Asia because I wanted to be close to home and close to my dad, who who's still here, uh, and who's the reason that I keep coming back to the island. Um, so I did that, um, and then I thought, you know, life is long, and there's a, a big world out there to see. So I took kind of a radical left turn and I went off to the Middle East. I went to Iraq. And from there I went to um, Turkey. Um, and uh, then with assignments in between back in Washington, including one working for Colin Powell as one of his special yeah. assistants. Um, and then as Tony Blinken's chief of staff when he was the uh, deputy secretary of state. And then from January of 2020, um, I started as the ambassador in Albania, and that was uh, uh, a nomination that was made by President Trump um, and an assignment that continues under um, President Biden. And I think that's uh, one of the things that um, is special about being in the Foreign Service. Uh, we uh, swear an oath to defend and protect the Constitution of the United States. Um, we don't uh, pledge allegiance to any particular party or any particular president. Um, but as the American ambassador, um, you are the personal representative of whoever is the president who says, this is my person. So for me, I had the great honor of doing that under uh, President Trump. Um, and now I have the great honor of doing that under President uh, Biden. Before we get into uh, more of your ambassadorship in Albania, I wanted to go back towards some of the um, highlights of your career in, in, in China and Iraq and Turkey. And, and you speak Turkish, correct? A little bit, uh-huh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so so what, 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 if, as you look back, uh, your first uh, duty station, China, what, what stands out to you? Uh, well, this was, uh, you know, I went out there in 1997 and um, it, you could feel the energy. Something was happening in that country. Um, and um, so, you know, economically or politically, the whole thing, the whole country, but more so economically. Um, I was there at a time when um, you would see entire neighborhoods just literally rising up overnight because they do 24 hour construction, massive um, in scale. And um, there was uh, a lot of energy. You could feel the, the money just kind of uh, swirling around, um, buildings going up, ideas being generated, um, and uh, a sense of, uh, of um, um, some uh, ignition happening. And so I was very uh, fortunate to have been able to live in China at that time. 
um, and then to continue to track um, the, the progress or the lack of progress in some areas uh, that China has made. Um, and from a very um, personal point of view, to see how all of that has affected um, our island, um, both for uh, uh, in, in positive and in negative ways. I think mostly in positive ways, um, but it is a changing world now. And yeah. I think um, Guam plays a pivotal role in that, whether it's uh, uh, in terms of defense, commerce, trade, and the economy, um, socially, um, and so I'm, it, it's, it's great to be back on island for the first time in about four years. You know, I had to stay away because of COVID. Yeah. Um, but it's great to be back and um, to see firsthand uh, the changes that are taking place here. Yeah. I'm looking forward to a conversation that I'm going to be having with the Guam Chamber of yeah. Commerce <laughs> as well as separately with the um, Women's Chamber of Commerce as well. And I think that th those are going to be very informative converse conversations. Yeah, and I think uh, they're look looking anxiously to to hear what you have to say. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, China in the in the mid '90s. That's when it began to mm -hmm. emerge um, as an economic superpower, and it yeah. has never really stopped since then. How about the Middle East? Um, that must have been a big change from China to the Middle East. Yeah, yeah, it was. Um, it, it's a different dynamic there altogether. Um, but when you look at uh, China, the Middle East, and the rest of the world, I think you know, you're looking at several factors coming up. One is that um, the world is more interconnected than it's ever been before. Yes. And people are able to, to communicate, we're able to travel, um, and connect in ways that we've never been able to do before. And, and that's owing to transportation, but it's also owing, of course, to communications technology and the internet. Um, and what that does. Um, the second big factor that uh, we need to think about is um, the alignment of um, climate change plus energy. And whether it's the Middle East or Asia, you can see those changes affecting the way we live our lives and they should affect the way that we plan for the future. In Full Zoom is presented by Calvo Enterprises, Inc. and IT&E. GU Self Storage, conveniently located near the Harmon McDonald's. We offer affordable rates, online payments, and auto bill pay for your convenience. Plus, gate access daily from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Call us today at 648-7867 for more information. In Full Zoom is presented by Calvo Enterprises, Inc. and IT&E. And OPEC, around that time, I think that you were there, was very much the dominant force in, in, in the energy world, uh, mm -hmm. more so than it might be right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you work for, for, for Colin Powell yeah. and for Tony Blinken, mm -hmm. both uh, secretaries of state, maybe mm -hmm. not Blinken at that time, but mm -hmm. um, tell us about that experience. Yeah. Um, you know, Colin Powell uh, is legendary for good reason. Um, he's one of these people who uh, would inspire people to just stand up and start clapping for him without having <laughs> to wow. do anything be besides walk into a room. Yeah, he just um, has he, that presence. He yeah. had command presence. And when he walked into a room, you knew he was there and you felt good about it. So um, that's pretty unique. And um, I learned a lot of leadership lessons from him, um, just in the way that uh, he dealt with other leaders, uh, but also in the way that he took care of his troops, so to speak. Um, think uh, his military background as, uh, as a general in the armed forces um, had a huge impact on the way that he dealt with the people who worked around him and for him. And so I've tried to take some of those lessons. Um, the same thing, uh, slightly different with Tony Blinken, who uh, has a leadership style uh, that is um, very inclusive. And you see a lot of that coming through now in the way the Biden administration um, emphasizes the importance of uh, diversity, inclusion, uh, access, and equity um, in making sure that uh, we're taking full advantage of the full diversity and, uh, and variety of talent that the United States has to offer, um, irrespective of where someone comes from uh, where someone lives, uh, color of their skin, economic background, all of those things. Um, those are secondary to whether you've got something to give to the country. And I'm really proud to be part of that effort. Yeah. 
Okay, let me talk, let's uh, talk about how, how do you become an ambassador? And what was your reaction when you first uh, got the call that says, hey, we want you to be, uh, represent yeah. us uh, as ambassador to Albania? Well, there are two broad paths. One is the career path, right? So um, generally speaking, uh, you know, we have probably um, somewhere on the order of 160 ambassadorships around the world. And um, as I mentioned before, ambassadors um, are the personal representative of the president. So by right, the president uh, is uh, um, able to nominate whoever uh, he or she uh, feels will best represent him or her personally uh, al alongside implementing uh, the administration's policies. So 70% of those 160 jobs uh, have traditionally, 70 to 60% have traditionally gone to career diplomats like myself. And then the remainder have gone to political appointees. And, and these are often people who have had an active hand in supporting uh, the president when uh, he or she was a candidate, um, so on. And so for us, uh, it takes a long time uh, if you're a career foreign service officer. Uh, you gotta climb up through the ranks and it's like the military. Um, it's an up or out system. So within a certain number of years, uh, at each rank, you have to be promoted or you have to leave the service. Oh, I didn't realize uh, that. Yeah. yeah, 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 very much so. Um, and then uh, at a certain point in your career, if you're lucky enough, uh, then you may be asked to serve uh, as an ambassador. And for us, of course, there's no greater honor uh, sure. than to get to represent our country uh, overseas, um, but especially so as an ambassador. So it's, uh, it, it's been quite an experience. Yes, I can imagine. You're the first uh, U.S. ambassador born in South Korea and the first U.S. ambassador to have grown up in Guam. So uh, we are so very proud of you. Uh, so what do we need to know about Albania? I had to look it up on Google because I didn't know a whole lot. So Albania <laughs> is a wonderful place. Um, I didn't know that much about Albania before I went there either. Um, and what I found there is that it's a country that is probably the most pro-American country in the world. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They joke, but not really, about uh, being more pro-American than Texas. And I have to say that I have never been in a country where I, I have felt more um, welcomed as an American. And um, it's a very warm culture. Um, in many ways, it reminds me of Guam. Uh, it's a country that has a population of about 2.8 million. Um, it's on the Mediterranean, you know, on the uh, Ionian and Adriatic Seas. It must be beautiful. Um, Do you remember? It's beautiful. Yeah. Very beautiful. The mountains are uh, majestic. They're rugged. Um, and then this, the, the sea coast is just spectacular. I, I want to say that, um, you know, it might almost be as beautiful as Guam. <laughs> uh, it's certainly different. But I, I hope that more people will go and visit. Um, you know, family relations play a big part. And in the same way that, you know, we have our various uh, familia connections here and, you know, which village you, uh, you're from and what schools you went to, um, it's like that there as well. And so there's a lot um, about my having grown up on Guam that informs my ability to understand what's going on in other parts of the world. Um, and so Albania has been a wonderful experience. And when I tell them about what life is like on Guam, you know, they, they also agree. It, it sounds very, <laughs> very familiar. Yeah. What would you say your, the emphasis of your work has been in Albania? Anything controversial at all? Um, well, our uh, focus is on democracy, defense, and business. So what that means in practice is that um, we are helping the Albanians strengthen the rule of law and to reduce corruption. Um, so that more people can uh, become richer. You know, uh, to be very blunt, that's that's what it is, right? Um, in a corrupt system, it's just a few who are benefiting, and um, so we want to help them get to a place where the country as a whole is richer. The second element is uh, defense, and so for the first time in Albania's history, um, U.S. troops are being stationed there, and um, you know we're just in time. Uh, it turns out to have been prescient because of what we're seeing uh, in terms of the challenge from Russia, um, as we've seen in yeah. Ukraine, right? So it, it's, a, it's a dangerous world out there, and we all need to be 
be prepared. And Albania, as a member of NATO uh, and as an aspiring member of the European Union, has an important role to play. Yeah. Um, and the final piece of that is um, business. So one of the big tasks uh, that American diplomats have is to uh, look out for American citizens. And in fact, that's our number one goal, right? Whether it's taking care of Americans who are in trouble um, or issuing visas so that uh, people can go and visit America or do business with America, that's an important goal. More broadly, um, we also try to um, uh, help American companies and American businesses um, uh, make connections. Um, and uh, find ways to invest um, in ways that make sense in countries like Albania. In Full Zoom is presented by Calvo Enterprises, Inc. and IT&E. GU Self Storage, conveniently located near the Harmon McDonald's. We offer affordable rates, online payments, and auto bill pay for your convenience. Plus, gate access daily from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Call us today at 648-7867 for more information. In Full Zoom is presented by Calvo Enterprises, Inc. and IT&E. I imagine that the introduction of U.S. troops to Albania was a pretty delicate situation. I think in any country, when there are foreign troops that are allowed, it, it yes, becomes very sensitive. Yeah? But you know what, Nestor? This is what I mean about Albania being uh, exceptionally pro-U.S. Over there, they were excited. I don't think that there was any serious objection to U.S. forces. And in fact, you know, they're coming from having been under communist dictatorship for 45 years, right? So communism collapsed uh, just in 1991. That's not that far away. That's right. 31 years ago. Yeah. And for them, uh, they're, they're big believers in, um, in the ideals that America stands for democracy, freedom, capitalism, defense alliances. Um, and so uh, they had wanted U.S. forces to be more engaged in Albania. So this is something uh, that's happening um, with um, kind of uh, um, mutual um, uh, desire to do this. And um, it's kind of a happy situation over there. We got a, a few minutes left, but I wanted to get uh, since uh, we got you here, I wanted to ask you about uh, Speaker Pelosi mm -hmm. because you are a diplomat and you're familiar with that circle. So she was um, on her way from Guam to Singapore and I think Japan and uh, South Korea, but there was talk in Washington, concern in Washington, that she was going to go to Taiwan mm -hmm. uh, over the objections of Beijing, of course. Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts on that? Should she go to Taiwan? Well, I think the administration has been uh, has already spoken out on this issue. I don't think that there is anything further that uh, I can or should add. And um, I think we're right in the middle of uh, the situation. So let's see what happens. Yeah. Do, with, with your experience in China, um, is it uh, correct to assume that um, they would be um, very, very angry at uh, such a high-ranking American going to a country that they uh, see as a renegade province? Um, they have a hardline view uh, when it comes to Taiwan. And the United States also has a long-standing position on Taiwan. Um, and uh, that's encapsulated in our One China policy. Um, and uh, I'll just leave it there. I appreciate. It. I know. I know that there are some some limitations on some things that you you can't talk about. But I appreciate the fascinating conversation, and thank you so much for the time. I know that the the folks at the chamber and, and all the others that are going to see you are going to be full of questions, uh, just as I was. So thank you very much, Ambassador Yuri Kim. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you for for watching, everyone, and we'll be back again next week with in full Zoom back to our regular format. I'm Nestor Lecanto. Thanks for watching. We'll see you then. In Full Zoom is presented by Calvo Enterprises, Inc. and IT&E.